Hello, a very good evening. Whatever our present constitution is, it is not Indic. Yeah. And in fact, I think that is one of the major theses of my book. Even the non-Hindus in the constituent assembly had a very strong sense of India as a dharmic land. Right. Of that, there is no question. The, the middle class, finally, as they say, is the backbone of any society. Yeah. The very rich and the very poor, sorry to say, don't count yeah. in the long run as far as the country moving forward is concerned. Yeah. For example, Kashmir is made into a separate state just by itself, mm -hmm. without Jammu even. It can beat Bulgaria in rose oil production. Right. And therefore, our small state of Kashmir will become more significant in world economy than a whole country called Bulgaria. Right. This is what I mean when I say that smaller states can be leveraged enormously right. economically. I don't envisage India at 100, mm -hmm. I envisage Bharat at 100. Wonderfully said. A very good evening and welcome to this joint podcast between Bharat Varta and Swarajya magazine. I am very privileged and honoured to be joined by Professor Gautam R. Desi Raju. Now a little bit of an introduction about him and I have to read it out because it's quite elaborate and I had to very painfully shorten it allowing some minimization to be done. Professor Desi Raju is a structural chem uh, chemist who has been in the solid state and structural chemistry unit of the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore since 2009. Prior to this, he had, he had been in the University of Hyderabad for about 30 years. He has played a major role in the development and growth of the subject of crystal engineering. He is one of the most highly cited Indian scientists with more than 430 research papers 40,000 citations and an H index of 83. He is a former president of the International Union of Crystallography, is a recipient of an honorary doctorate degree of the Universidad Nacional de Cordoba, Argentina and of the Royal Sima University in Karnul. He has won many awards for his work and today he is a proud author of the book Bharat India 2.0. Sir, thank you so much. Namaste to you and a very warm welcome to this joint podcast hosted between Bharat Vata and Swarajya. Namaste, Sharon. I'm happy to be speaking with you for the podcast Bharat Vata. As you were kind enough to say a little bit about my scientific contributions. Small correction, I think the number of citations and the H index mm -hmm. is a uh, little, little bit more than what you have mentioned. <laughs> so. Uh, recently, <laughs> some an admirer of mine told me that my H, H index has uh, touched 100. Right. And the number of citations, I think, has crossed 60,000 or something. I mean, not uh, necessarily <laughs> blowing my own trumpet, <laughs> but better to be technically correct in some of these things. <laughs> Thank you so much for correcting me. So, first of all, let me begin by asking you about this. You begin by writing in the preface of the book, and I quote, the actions of our judges seem whimsical and interventionist, whilst the executive, especially in its bureaucracy, appear distant and aloof. Tell me, sir, are we as a nation which is perhaps uh, 75 years old now, still struggling to get its fundamentals right? Uh, perhaps we are still reeling through an identity crisis of its own even after gaining independence since 1947. Sharon, it takes time. Uh, the colonial period, I believe, was so debilitating to even our very thought processes and uh, the manner in which we were able to think or even react to things. We adopted a certain mode of governance which I and others have recounted, I in this book of mine about which we are going to speak today. And yes, I feel that uh, the judiciary and the executive still have to find their bearings in how best they are going to be able to serve our motherland. I don't want to be judgmental and necessarily very critical about any of these wings of government. Right. But yes, I did feel that today, especially the judiciary, has become very interventionist. They are usurping the functions of the executive in more ways than one. And the whole process, I think, which began with the Keshwananda Bharati 
yeah. judgment. I think gradually the judiciary, if I may put it, is occupying all the comfortable space available to them. Yeah. Okay. And as far as the executive is concerned, again, I don't want to be very critical. I've made some critic. I've mentioned some critical comments made by others about the IAS, and uh, it's very fashionable to criticize the IAS and make them whipping boys of everything. Yeah. But, you know, they too have a very tough job. Mm. And I think uh, the executive is also, higher executive is grossly understaffed. Right. Certainly the IFS, the foreign service is terribly understaffed yes. today. Yes. So they too are working under severe stress and strain, the honest ones. Yeah. And because this brings up the other question also of corruption in the judiciary and the executive wings. It's an open thing now, even the Prime Minister has spoken about the need to reduce corruption in our country. Right. So it's a combination of many things that made me write what I wrote in the preface. Because mm -hmm. I wanted, well, when I pick up a new book, I usually glance through the preface yeah. to try to get to know the mind of the author. Right. Because when I don't know who the author is, I think the preface often gives away many things. Yes. And the preface in my book is perhaps a tad longer than prefaces in many books. But I wanted to say a little about why exactly I was writing this book. And right. yes, you are right. The behavior of the judiciary and the executive have been a matter of concern to me, especially in recent times. But are these shortcomings just technical in nature in terms of how, uh, say, for example, the foreign services are understaffed? Or do you see a point of departure in your writing, especially about the judiciary and the executive, because you feel that the institutions uh, which were created post-1947 are perhaps Westphalian in nature? Yes, it's a good follow-up question. It's not just, the problem is not just technical in nature. Mm -hmm. It's what you said, this post-Westphalian nation state, and I try to explain in chapter 3 that there are actually two types of nation states. Yeah. Whichever type of nation state you are talking about, we are not one. We are not a nation state of any sort. Right. And yes, in trying to force fit a judiciary and an executive in the nation state model and also in the model of this strange country, the United Kingdom, yeah. which doesn't have a written constitution. Yeah. And I have tried to explain in the book uh, that the so-called unwritten constitution of the United Kingdom mm. is a very poor model for a constitution of all other right. countries who have written constitutions. Right. So there is a fundamental difference between mm. the, all the other countries who have written constitutions and this one country that has an unwritten constitution. Yeah. And simply because they colonized us and ruled us, I think almost... As, a matter of default or as a matter of faith, article of faith. I believe that we chose a model that was basically very, very wrong for us. Right. I don't think it was at all the model that, the, especially this country us. was, a, it's not even a nation state in the end. Hmm. So, and then, you know, to take the UK constitution and use it as a model, I think the entire model itself is wrong. So, um, I have likened it to, you know, trying to build a house. Uh, with faulty bricks or substandard bricks. Yeah. But then even if your plan is good, if the engineer is top class and everything is, you know, going gung ho, yeah. you will not get a very good house at the end of the show. You know? Because the foundations are not set properly. Foundation, the plan itself, is, I believe, is not proper. Okay. And I'm really glad you arrived at this because my next question was going to be on that. And I hope you don't mind my uh, interventions now and then. And no, no, no. I mean, we are here to talk to each other, not for me to give a monologue. <laughs> Although I don't mind listening to a monologue from you, no, no, <laughs> but no, no, no. Uh, my next question is that we, uh, like you said, we take a lot of pride and uh, especially for those who, those of us who have studied uh, social sciences as a major or even in school, a certain amount of pride is uh, kept in the fact that our constitution is inspired from the West, from Ireland, from United Kingdom, uh, from the United States, from France and different countries. But do you see this problem as an outcome of the Anglophile mindset, which you also mention in one of the chapters of your book, that we've developed as a result of the colonial rule. If yes, 
is it not the right time to perhaps question if we were actually drawing inspiration from the wrong set of nations is perhaps not the right term but perhaps we should have been more indic and more rooted towards what we wanted as as a nation state a long question sharan um, sorry for which that. You know, which actually has many sub questions in it and i do believe i have addressed many of these issues in the book yes sir there were i think basically two ways for the constituent assembly to have proceeded yeah in uh, 1946 or more properly in 1947 right when we obtained formal independence that is a, a constitution which takes its inspiration from those of the liberal democracies of the west or to make a complete break and go for an indic form of governance is a very important but little known constitutional document called the gandhian constitution right. of 1946 yes. which i cover in some detail in my book and it was not written by gandhi but uh, from the preface to that little book which gandhi wrote it is clear that he had an active part to play in the writing of that book and it describes essentially an indic model for governance which uh, goes back to the village as the core unit yeah actually it is quite reminiscent of the ancient greek democracy so that a number of villages would then get together and form a taluk which would then form a district and in this manner the governance would be truly bottom up yeah so that would be a fully indic model or at least the core of what we may call an indic model today but i have also tried to explain and justify why the constituent assembly did not pick that model but rather went for a model which for lack of any better term i have called anglosphere right. model in a sense i don't think it was i don't think ours was a cut and paste constitution as is alleged by some people mm-hmm. i think we had no alternative sharan at that point in time because we had elected to be a liberal democracy so if you want to be a liberal democracy in the modern post world war 2 world then there are certain things which you must have you must have the three wings of government yeah the legislative the executive and the judiciary with some degree or no degree of overlap between these things we opted to have a parliament yeah which is also okay is it that or is it because there is there was an active failure on the part of the political class to perhaps acknowledge this because if you see uh, I'm, i'm sorry to interrupt mm. if you look at who the constitutional uh, constitution today perhaps really represents one can even go to an extent of saying that it's very cosmopolitan in nature and that the aam janta is not covered and the indic values that we espouse for in the constitution is perhaps not represented at all but it's not indic whatever our present constitution is it is not indic yeah. and in fact i think that is one of the major theses of my book right that the supreme role of dharma in any governance system yeah which ought to have been natural for this country is simply not there right okay but see the members of the constituent assembly as i could make out by reading the debates and indeed i went through the day to day transcripts of the debates that was my original reading source and reading right. material they were all fierce nationalists right there is no and i think the vast majority of them the hindus anyway were all devout hindus yeah there is no doubt in my mind that the tone and tenor of their comments except for maybe very fringe minorities here and there even the non hindus in the constituent assembly had a very strong sense of india as a dharmic land right of that there is no question i think since we had to go since we wanted to go let's shall i say the liberal democracy route yeah and also this is another practical point in handling and dealing with the other countries of the world the other liberal democracies of the world in the post world war 2 united nation structure right it is important that we have a constitution that at least relates in part to things that the external world is familiar with right unless you do something completely different and seal yourself off like say china yeah but india decided not to seal itself off in 1947 right it wanted to interact with the world 
even in the pre-constitutional era, I have uh, mentioned that even starting with 1900, 1905, the Minto Mali reforms, Indians were expressing their wishes and desires in a language that would be understood by the Britisher. Yeah. So, partly the idiom was sort of not forced on us, but it almost fell on us by default. But having said this, I think we missed an opportunity that even within this language and rubric of the Western democracies, yeah. we did not include the dharmic component. And it is not even a component. This country is dharma. Right. So, if the basic nature of this country, this land, physical land, because geography is very important. Right. And for the first time, I will use the word civilizational state. This fundamental thing, our constitution has failed to incorporate whether intentionally or unintentionally is left to the readers of the book. I think I have given enough background in the book for the reader to, you know, opine on this matter, right. whether they did it intentionally or not. If one were, one were to challenge your hypothesis and even go to an extent of saying that, uh, you know, many other countries which were decolonized uh, since the 1950s up to uh, the 2000s even, Many of them are doing independently very well in spite of being liberal democracies in nature. I mean, look at Canada, the United States uh, and uh, Australia and many of these countries which are even now very loyal to the Commonwealth uh, idea. And this is just a thought that I had in mind that I would like uh, your view on this. A good thought. These other countries have shown more originality than us. Why do you say so? The, the USA is a very special case. You mentioned you clubbed the USA with the others. Right. The USA is a very special case and anybody reading my book uh, will understand that I have a great admiration for the US constitution. Right. In fact, I wish that Ambedkar, Ambedkar also was naturally inclined to the US constitution. Yes. And why on earth did we not choose the US constitution as a model? But why did we rather opt to go for this unwritten UK constitution uh, is another question. But the US is a very special constitution. It's one of the shortest constitutions in the world, if right. not the very shortest. Right. And it has been amended the least number of times. And I've written in chapter 5 that it's the only country that, it, that got its constitution exactly right at the first shot. Right. You know, bingo. They got it exactly right. Every other country, liberal democracy that has struggled with a written constitution, right. have always got it wrong. And as I uh, <laughs> describe in chapter 5, they all took about 100 years to get it right. Right. The USA got it right immediately. Coming back to what you said, the other countries, you see Canada, Australia, New Zealand have all changed in significant ways. I mean, New Zealand went to proportional representation long, long ago. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah, correct. And I think many of them have abolished this abomination called the upper house. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yes, I think the, the first thing that we should do if we have our wits about us, yeah. is to abolish the upper house immediately because it serves absolutely no purpose. Even on state levels? More so at the state levels, yeah. I would say. <laughs> at the state levels, it's a, a total irrelevance. Yeah. At the central level, it's now become obstructionist. Right. You know, so, and I have devoted a lot of space in discussing the Rajya Sabha yes. and the total inappropriateness. I mean, the, the, the model, the only argument in favor of the Rajya Sabha that was given in the Constituent Assembly was that it will be something like the House of Lords. Yes, guided oh, the, by the wisdom of the seniors. See, the thing is, yes, the seniors, the seniors. <laughs> <laughs> Do they look like seniors to you today in the Rajya Sabha? Now, uh, even by 1947, the House of Lords had become irrelevant in the UK. Right. You know, many of their powers were stripped away, I think, in the early 1900s. Mm. And then the hereditary peerages were taken away and stuff like that and uh, you have right. to look at it over a thousand year period to realize that they, they, they don't count even in the UK. Now, so okay, that apart, uh, I think Sri Lanka, I mean take Sri Lanka which was another commonwealth country, yeah. I mean they are in all kinds of problems today but for some other reason. But they yeah. changed their constitution in a radical way, more taking into account the fact that they were multi-religious and uh, at the same time, they want to be dharmic in their own way. Right. So, they are also part of this landmass. Yeah. Uh, they are almost between the ocean and the mountain. They are Correct. a little separate thing, but they are still north of the ocean. No? So, yeah. so they are still here. So, these other countries have not hesitated. Oh, we have simply sort of stuck to that uh, model unimaginative. 
Right. And whenever we felt we faced a problem, we went uh, to this curious route of amendments. You know, amendments I feel is like when you have a, say a serious injury and then you go on putting band-aid upon band-aid. And there's an attempt to glorify these amendments saying that, you know, it's very timely and it's required. Mm. So it, 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 you know, it goes with the uh, yes. phase of... I think most of those amendments, starting with the very first amendment, that freedom of speech and then the right to land, yeah. especially what they have done with uh, Article 31 and all that. None of this is very healthy and it was all meant to serve the political needs of the people who were politically in power at that time. Right. And an amendment was never supposed to be used for that. Like if you have a political agenda, I think the directive principles are broad enough to guide that, us. Yes, so that a, a different political agendas can be adjusted within the directive principles. Right. You don't, should not make so many amendments, certainly not in the fundamental rights part of the constitution. This part 4 and all, you should not touch. There are so many, 104 amendments I think we have now. Even as we speak, the number may be going up. Yeah. So, so many amendments simply means that the original plan was not correct. Right. Isn't it? Right. So, let me focus a little bit on the economic governance when it started being conceived in the pre-independent era, just in the 19, early 1940s. Would you say that we were doing much better before a few years perhaps before independence than after we got independence? And I think this one of this point is also made in uh, Sanjay Baru's book, uh, The Bombay Plan, where he says uh, many industrialists who had contributed to the development of India initially were inconvenienced by Neh Nehruvian policies after we got independence. So my point is that many of the industrialists who were doing uh, perhaps well at that uh, period of time with inconveniences from the colonial rule were perhaps more inconvenienced after Nehru came into power because of his economic uh, mindset. Mm. You see in the pre-independence era even in the 30s and 40s influential groups of industrialists were also trying to rein in and control Gandhi right. and I think they were actually some of them were quite nervous about the Quit India movement because they felt that it would have all sorts of adverse effects on their businesses which it did. Right. Okay. So, it was always I think a sort of a tension between the industrial community and the political people. Right. Certainly, I don't think it's even a matter for discussion or argument mm -hmm. that uh, Nehru inconvenienced the industrialists greatly. Yeah. Because his own policies were defined by that uh, soft Fabian philosophy Correct. of the 30s. Of course, in a sort of an article of faith that uh, since the poor of the country have to be lifted up, the poor had become poor because of exploitation. So, painting the industrialist as the bad character in the whole drama, I think almost became an article of faith. I mean, it's not for me to speak too much about this because learned economists and experts have written volumes and treatises on the matter. and. All I will say is that a non-expert who has actually written this book, a better balance between socialism and free market economy might have been attempted. There is no doubt that in the terrible grind of post-colonial poverty, a certain healthy dose of socialistic policies was required. Right. But did it mean it had to go so far? as to remove the fundamental right to ownership of land. Yeah. You know, uh, the, 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 the uh, Nehru moved extremely far in, in that direction. Did he, did he go too far? So did his successors. I mean, honestly, all the blame is laid see, on Nehru. See, ha, the successors, I don't think, Up until see, Nehru was still, I, I believe, I think an idealist. Right. I think he didn't even have to worry about getting votes. Because right. he was yeah. getting the votes Very anyway. Popular. Okay. Correct. I think the successors started worrying about getting votes. Mm -hmm. And then they, they went very far and they went ridiculously far. Yeah. And uh, he then developed into this freebie culture. I think uh, the freebie culture in the economy wise and then the reservations in the educational and social sectors yeah. was all part of this. I mean, I grew up. I was a kid going to school and college in the height of the so-called socialistic pattern of society. Right. And even in the middle class family that I grew up, uh, it was not a very pleasant experience. 
because there were severe shortages of everything mm -hmm. in the 1960s and early 70s and things like that. And when you have, you see, you must have a balance, Sharon, because there is the, the middle class finally, as they say, is the backbone of any society. Yeah. The very rich and the very poor, sorry to say, don't count yeah. in the long run as far as the country moving forward is concerned. Yeah. I think what was happening is that because the socialistic pattern of society went too far, the middle class also started getting demoralized. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is okay to say, all right, we've had a rough time and, you know, we've still got to make our way forward. Yeah. But then the, the people in power, the government of the day has to make people feel, all people feel right. that they are stakeholders in this vast land. Right. And I think this was totally absent. I think the very poor are so poor that I think they weren't, weren't even able to realize. I mean, getting through the day itself, people didn't have two square meals a day in those days. So, it was very bad. It was a, would have been a challenge for any government. Yeah. Any government. And I think, uh, let us say in all fairness to Mrs. Gandhi, after 67, when many regional parties started getting power in the states and so on. And when she was forced to go to the communists for political support in 71, yeah. I think even she was walking on eggshells. Right. You know, for the... India is a very difficult country. I mean, such a big country, so poor, and uh, we were not yet aspirational. But would have been a challenge for anyone. Right. But even given all this and giving them all this kind of benefit of the doubt, I still think they abused the constitution right. and tried to make the constitution or their amended version of the constitution. I mean, especially outrageous is the introduction of those two words, terrible words, uh, secular and socialist. Yeah. Uh, and a very controversial circumstances during the emergency. Yeah. So doing all those things are distorting and using then this amended constitution as a uh, alibi, literally for all sorts of what I would now call wrongdoings. Yeah. I think that was that was immoral. What struck me early on while browsing through the book is that, and perhaps I'm reading too much into this, is the limited chapterization. Because uh, usually when books of this kind are written, uh, there's an elaborate chapterization between the phases because you start early on and you've covered quite a significant uh, period of uh, history. So is there a particular thought process and a reason behind uh, doing this? Yes, definitely. I think, um, firstly, as I have been very careful to emphasize, this is not a book meant for scholars. There are a great many people who know a lot more about the constitution, the legal aspects, right. and the political aspects of the whole situation. I have written this book for young people. As I have written in the preface, throughout my working life, uh, it's now going to be, what, 40... 43 years as an independent academic. I have dealt with people in the age group roughly of 18 to 30. This is the group that I know very well because my profession brought me into direct contact with this age group day in and day out. So I have written this book for a curious, you know, more than average aware youngster who may want to know a little bit more about his or her country. The preliminary indications I have had from people who have read excerpts from the book or the book itself tell me that in this, as in this respect, my book might be quite useful. It is partly written in an educational way. Right. It is meant for easy reading. It is not meant, you do not have to read my book with keeping a dictionary and a thesaurus and Google and other things in front of you. Yeah. It's meant to be read like a story. That's why I have not even put reference numbers right. anywhere in the book. My publisher actually was questioning me about that. And she said that, uh, are you sure you don't want to have references, footnotes? I said, no. I said, I want people to read this free and easy. Right. And you've told me just now that you've read a few chapters. I would say that the book is so written, like some of my scientific books, that you can just take any chapter and read it on its own. Right. It forms a little short story in itself. So I think the story of India, the story of India and its constitution and 
what we have done with it and the wrong things we have done with it mostly and what we really are and trying to become, it is a story. Mm. So I think it's got to be, this book has to be looked at like a story book. It is not meant to be, you know, dissected. Right. And say, oh, Professor Desi Raju, but you know, this particular reference, you have not mentioned so and so yeah. person who actually said this in 1923. No, yeah. if you want to do that, I think you've got to go to some other book. Yeah. And but uh, is there a particular reason that you decided to write uh, on topics like these? Because I, I know that you've addressed this in different interviews. Uh, but for our viewers, uh, since you come from a background of science, uh, what made it so fascinating for you to write this? It's again a natural question that many have asked me because structural chemistry and uh, civilizational state are very far away from <laughs> each other. Yeah, I was always fond of history. Right. And uh, the problem was I was even fonder of chemistry. Okay. So these were the two subjects that I really liked in school and I could not t study both at the school living level based on the examination system in the ISC, the Indian right. school certificate which is what I took and passed in 1968. So I had to make a, a choice when I entered class 9 as to whether I wanted to go into the science stream or the humanity stream. Yeah. So I, I was crazy about chemistry and so that is where I went. But I have never stopped reading history Okay. Uh, throughout the years and when I was very involved in my professional uh, works in the 1990s especially, then I stopped all this other reading. But I have always had this interest because I feel that uh, history is a subject which uh, is also relevant to all other subjects including science. Right. In fact, just two or three days ago. I gave a lecture in Pahalgam in Kashmir uh, where we had a very top level conference in crystal engineering which is my subject. Mm -hmm. In my talk, maybe partly induced by this book that I have written, I spoke about many, actually only about the historical developments in my subject over the last 30-40 years. Right. And I think when you apply history to any other subject, it is not just a case of what happened. Yeah but also what did not happen and why that did not happen. Right. So I think if you start applying those yardsticks, then you will be actually able to employ history in a very nice and useful way. I mean, they say history repeats itself. Yes. I think history repeats itself only in the hands of the ignorant. Right. So I think if you read history properly, you will learn how not to make the mistakes that the people in the past have made. And it is in that spirit, therefore, that I wrote. So, actually, I think it is quite natural. A couple of scientists who have read the manuscript have told me that only a scientist could have written this book on the constitution. Mm -hmm. And that is why I would like to invite people who are constitutional experts and people in the legal profession and so on to read my book in the spirit of what somebody very much outside their field thinks about the constitution. I mean, yeah. Of course, they are free to say that the whole thing is nonsense from beginning to end. Yeah. But I hope that I have used enough data and used enough of inductive logic throughout the book right. to figure out why certain things happened and why more, more important for us in the constitution, why certain things did not happen, right. which would have answered some of the questions you asked me earlier in this interview. Since you have been following history and reading it uh, for a very long time now and now we have authored a book as well. Uh, how do you, as a writer of history, you know, avoid the binaries that people are falling into, especially because history is written in such a way that, uh, you know, in phases it evolves and the kind of writing too evolves with Is it really phases. written in that way? No, I don't think so. I mean, if you I mean, look it, at some of uh, Peter Frankopan's books mm -hmm. on the Silk Route and the New Silk Route and so on, yeah. I think uh, modern historians are, uh, are also aware of the fact that the, these are not, uh, it's not a binary affair anymore. Right. It might have been binary in simpler times, but today if you mind, for example, this is not history. By the way, Sharan, I am no historian and to any historian who is watching this, I, uh, I am not claiming to be a historian at all. But just the a person… The book deals with a little bit of history. Is how well, a little bit is, is inevitable and that is why I decided to stop 
discussing personalities with the emergency right because as i said after that history becomes current affairs yeah and current affairs as we know from today's current affairs what was true last week is may not be true next week yeah. but anyway coming back to this matter uh, i would say that uh, i think it's all right i mean uh, you can use history and you can use it in the in the current context i don't see anything wrong in people in widely different professions using the historical methodology to the extent that they are able to to try to understand phenomena better i mean take the ukraine right. situation you know the whole world and the alignments between countries have changed completely after ukraine yeah you know we had a covid and then there was some uneasy period and then you had ukraine mm. now yesterday's friends will become today's enemies suddenly right the neutrals will become friends friends may become neutrals Mm. and the polarization i mean today we talk about the fact that you talked about economy earlier mm. i think this uh, rupee ruble exchange mechanism yeah. Yeah. yesterday i in fact read an article that uh, before long germany might uh, apply to become a member of brics right. and apparently go back to the old deutsche mark yeah. and then suggest that the deutsche mark be used as the reserve currency of this brics new brics grouping right so you can see things are you know changing very very, very fast in the world Yeah. So I think this is a time when certainly historians cannot. I think maybe I mean it's a little mischievous for me to <laughs> say so, but I think you're talking about few of the Sarkari historians of the 1970s. Yeah, the who used stories. to deal with binaries, but yeah. I don't think we should. Because really why I say is that uh, your book uh, also deals with a few of the speeches that are, uh, uh, you know, said around the time of independence, especially those exchanges. Mm. Uh, with nehru and different other personalities mm, mm, mm. and uh, the men who challenged uh, nehru intellectually at that point of time mm. uh, and there were many of them are not very fondly remembered today especially uh, you know in terms of what ideas they had mm. it or, or they're very little remembered in terms of what they had to say mm. but uh, books like yours tries to actively revisit those chapters see i would like readers of my book to look at my book in that spirit that to look at some of these other glorious personalities right uh, in an unbiased light i mean the question the whole question of the demonization of savarkar yeah i think is something that is not only illogical but uh, completely without justification right so i think it is up to people to uh, realize that uh, in the end as i said i have written in some place that gandhi and savarkar were two sides of the same coin right and i said gandhi was a deeply religious hindu first who took his yes. religion into politics right whereas savarkar was an atheist mm. who decided to take politics into hinduism right okay because he realized both realized by the way both gandhi and savarkar realized that this land is a deeply religious country right and vivekananda had said that a couple of decades earlier that mm. almost literally the business of india is religion yeah and unless you approach the people with a religious idiom mm. anything that you do or say is not going to gain traction i think both these great individuals have uh, contributed a lot in fact at another point in the book i have said you talked about binaries yeah that is very sad to see people in india today young middle aged old talking about binaries i said for a change why don't you view these four personalities as one composite unit yeah and who are these four personalities vivekananda savarkar gandhi ambedkar mm. i think any country should feel itself really lucky that it had these four people absolutely all right so no not no one of them is absolutely right or absolutely wrong yeah so if i had to say father of the nation i would have you know four fathers yeah. you know these four people when I mean, they they appeared on the scene you know sharan at a time when india was at its lowest mm. 1900 we were mentally dead at that time and the british colonial regime was at its super zenith right you know physically mentally morally economically we were completely dead mm. and suddenly within two decades all these four gentlemen showed up on the scene mm. 
Now, any country should feel proud. And if today, I think if we're even standing straight, yeah. it's because of these four people. I'm very glad you said that because a lot of youngsters are divided on these lines of philosophies. And see, none of these four are gods. Okay, first. Yeah. Second, none of them was fully right or fully wrong. Correct. But then that is again should be natural to us yeah. in Sanatana Dharma, where we have six different ways of looking at the same thing. Right. Isn't it? Absolutely. So once you say that this is a culture that is very comfortable with having, thinking about a particular thing and there are five others who think about it in five different ways and we are equally comfortable with all these guys. Yeah. Then what's wrong in taking all these four as a composite person? These are four different ways of looking at India. Yeah. It is still the same India, you know, at the end. Let me draw your attention to an article that you recently wrote for Swarajya, which made the case for Indian states to be further divided into smaller states. And you ask, and I quote, is it too unreasonable to ask for 75 smaller states in the Union of India? As a gift, we give ourselves on the 75th anniversary of our independence. While I do agree with the premise, given the fact that, uh, uh, you know, newborn states like Uttarakhand have done exceptionally well on uh, several uh, metrics, there are also exceptions uh, in, uh, you know, states like Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, which have performed not perhaps as per the expectations uh, that people had before it got divided. Well, you want you want me to give away the secret of the book <laughs> two days <laughs> before its release? I mean, so far we have talked about things that everybody knows. Yeah. But uh, it'll be an exclusive for us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, see, I don't want to say. St I don't. I still don't want to say too much because sure. I want readers of the book to read chapter four. Because, uh, you know, as you know, chapter 1 talks about, uh, for, incidentally, for people who are interested, chapter 1 is titled India on 15th August 1947. Chapter 2 is titled India on 26th January 1950 and thereafter. Correct. Thereafter means till now. Yeah. Uh, chapter 3 is called the civilizational state. Mm. Okay, so this, the first three chapters actually set the stage for chapter 4, which is I believe a possible solution to our problems today and I am not ashamed to say I am with no real disrespect to my colleagues in the social sciences. I think the nature of the social sciences is that they are trained to analyze, dissect and uh, present the contours of a problem or a situation. Hmm. Now we in the hard sciences, we also do this, let me tell you. It is not that we are incapable of analysis, but we go further and we try to produce solutions. Right. So, if a scientist doesn't produce a solution, then he or she is no scientist. Correct. The solution that he or she proposes may well be criticized by others. It may be shown to be wrong. That doesn't matter. But yeah. science progresses in that way. So, what I have written in chapter 4, the 75 states, yes. We wanted to give a hint in this Swarajya article. The main thesis of the book, in fact, is that what the constitution fails to respect is the diversity of this country. Right. I think uh, at the time of the 75th anniversary, I think Mohan Bhagwatji, I think had one of the nicest things to say. He says India should be a role model to all other countries mm. in how to manage and handle diversity. Right. But no country in the world is as diverse as we are. Yeah. Okay. And I, it is my thesis that the constitution does not respect our diversity enough or that it is using improper measures of diversity, mm -hmm. such as language and things like that. So my thesis in the book, the book should be judged on this, is that by making smaller states, you are bringing out truer measures of diversity. Right. And recently I can tell an example since I have just come back from the Kashmir Valley. How many of us know that these two plants, lavender and rose, you know, grow practically wild in the valley. Lavender especially is, is practically grows anywhere. It requires very little water. Mm. And out of these you can extract fairly easily lavender oil and rose oil. Right. which have an extremely high markup price mm. in the international markets. Right. There is a small country 
in Southeast Europe called Bulgaria and the economy of Bulgaria, the whole country is practically dependent on rose oil alone. Okay. Hmm? I don't know how many viewers of this program would know that and I have been saying time and again over the last few years that if for example Kashmir is made into a separate state just by itself mm -hmm. without Jammu even shall we say for argument's sake. Yeah. It can beat Bulgaria in rose oil production right. and therefore our small state of Kashmir will become more significant in world economy than a whole country called Bulgaria. Right. This is what I mean when I say that smaller states can be leveraged enormously right. economically quite apart from you know handling the diversity issue. You mentioned Jharkhand. There are all sorts of other problems in Jharkhand. Mm. You have a mining mafia. Yeah. You know, you have the other state, I think, which you mentioned. Chhattisgarh. Chhattisgarh, yes. Chhattisgarh, in my view and as explained in the book, is already too big. Mm. Yeah, Even the is. Chhattisgarh is, that we have now is too big. Yeah. Because it contains geographically varied, very varied regions. Yeah. So, in my plan for division of uh, mm. states, and I hope you are not going to show the map now to no, the, no, no, no. because the map is the real <laughs> secret of the book where I have drawn the, the, the geographical limits right. for the 75 states. So, even there people will see that some states have been reorganized in ways that might seem to be unfamiliar. But, mm. you know, we should never be scared of the unknown in that sense. Right. And one should start debating these ideas. And so, I think the problems with the small states as we have now is not the small state per se, but still that they may be not small enough or maybe for other reasons in the constitution and the loopholes there. Mm. Still corruption, violence, casteism, other things are still too important. Mm. So that no matter what you do, that state is not going to come up. But that is an issue for the government of the day to handle. Right. And for the, what I would really like to see is a new constituent assembly, which I think there are already hints that, you know, that this amendments thing is cannot go on forever. Mm. Uh, the Supreme Court certainly the way it is running today, it cannot go on forever like this. There is no question about it. Right. Simple, simple backlog of cases tells you that it is not going to be possible. But yes, I do feel that the 75 states and chapter 4 uh, viewers of this program uh, gives the solution in terms of 75 states of what is presently the Indian Union as a means of enhancing diversity, optimizing diversity. The example of Yugoslavia is quite relevant. Because as right. I have explained, the five or six countries from the former Yugoslavia, Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, etc. represent the true measures of diversity there. And those nation states in that case yeah. are not going to fragment further. You know, the common objection given to 75 states is that there will be 75 chief ministers, mm. you know, with 75, you know, office cars going about and blocking <laughs> the traffic in 75 <laughs> different places. But I have also said, and an important caveat, that when you have 75 states, you must dump, listen viewers, you must dump the Westminster system completely. Because that Westminster system with the common legislature and executive is simply unsuited to us. Right. And this would be the best chance of going to something that looks more like the US model with a complete right. separation of legislature and executive. If you are able to do that, and this cannot be done with amendments. Yeah. You can make 75 states with Article 3 in the present constitution, but that's not going to be enough. If you simply make 75 states without separating executive and legislature completely, you might as well not do it. Right. Hmm. You write about people like Sam, Syed Ahmad Khan and uh, you mention, uh, you write about Muslim modernism uh, which existed back in the day. I'll keep this question rather open-ended because there are so many things that have unfolded ever since. How would you track the progress of this 75 years later? These yeah. have accounted for healthy debates before and no, immediately a, after independence. Certainly a thought-provoking question. And uh, I think Syed Ahmad Khan realized that unless the Muslim community of the then undivided India were to embrace modern education, the English language and especially right. science, science education. Mm. He said that unless they do this, there was no going to be no hope for the Muslim community. That was I think the position where he started. Right. I had a chance to visit actually 
AMU three or four years ago and I was shown many of his papers and books and things that he actually wrote there. I had a very affectionate welcome in the university and I think an audience of about 500 listened to me in rapt attention when I spoke about not only scientific things but also about the matters that you have raised, Muslim modernism. I think there is no doubt that if you look at, you know, say the book by Ahmed Kuru recently on Muslim modernism, if you take uh, what Purvis Hoodboy in Pakistan has written about uh, how Muslims should handle science, I mean, he's a physicist, I think in Lahore or some place like that. And uh, uh, the fact that it is realized by the Muslim community and I think by educated Muslims in India as well, that they need to handle the whole issue of modernism within the rubric of their religion, right. without getting into a contradiction mm. with certain articles of faith which any Muslim would like to subscribe to. Absolutely. Now, how have we progressed? Now, here I think the article, the, the answer is more disappointing. I think in terms of the freebies and the kind of vote gathering techniques, to put it crudely, mm. by politicians of all hues in our country, yeah. my own feeling is that the Muslims of India have retreated even further into their silos. Right. You know, uh, it has made them, I think, feel even more enclosed mm. in an increasingly constricted space, which is not at all good. For a community that is 220 million strong, yeah. if you notice in my book, I have never referred to Muslims as a minority community. Uh, yes. I have always called them the second majority. Yes. I think there are two majority communities in India, Sanatanis and Muslims. Yeah. And I also don't want to use the word Hindus because I think that's a very improper, you know, foreign language description of us. I would really like to see more people use words like Sanatani, mm. Bharat and so on, which is the main purpose of the book. And I think Muslims also should feel happy that they are the second majority. I mean, yeah. I mean, why, why, do, why do you call them minority? Man? There are more Muslims in India than in Pakistan. You know that. Yes. I mean, what are we talking about? Mm. The majority of the Muslims of the subcontinent did not opt to go to Pakistan or Bangladesh. Yeah, and that was done for a reason. That was uh, done for a reason. We will not get into that right now. Uh, just as a small follow-up uh, to what we were discussing, when the Hindu Code Bill was being passed in 1955, and you're right, mm -hmm. uh, J.B. Kriplani lambasted Nehru and said, I charge you with communalism because you are bringing forward a law about monogamy only for the Hindu community. Take it from me that the Muslim community is prepared, uh, and I underscore prepared, to have it, but you are not brave enough to do it. Hmm. Do you believe that the Muslim community is prepared even today for such changes or reforms or codifications? Because if we've, if we've witnessed something in the recent past, say the triple talaq when it was banned, uh, there were some quarters which were still very vehemently opposed to it. I 100% believe that the Muslim community of India will go for all these reforms. I right. have no doubt in my mind and I think the narrative of the Muslim community has also been hijacked. Right. by their own extremist groups right. who may or may not be in collusion with various political groups but that is a matter of speculation but I do feel that there is a tremendous urge on the part of Muslims to and this is part of the Muslim modernization mm. and I think uh, Kripalani was absolutely correct and I think uh, that I mentioned that name also because it is one of those names that was suppressed in the yes. Nehruvian era yeah. because they dared to challenge Nehru Correct. And so I think what he said was absolutely right. Ambedkar was even more caustic, by the way. Yes. About that, and yes. I think I have mentioned that you have not you have not raised that. But, but Ambedkar Kriplani was more polite. You yes. know, yeah. he, he was more polite. But uh, and I think Shyam Prasad Mukherjee was also very very virulent about this matter. Yes. And because they felt that it was all unnecessary, but I think already the idea of the Muslim vote bank was in Nehru's mind, and right. I think uh, okay. he, the, the so-called Rainbow Coalition that he engineered in UP. Yeah. The Brahmins, the scheduled castes and the Muslims, mm. thereby bypassing the Hindu middle classes, the middle castes. Yeah. I think that was the arithmetical formula that he used to keep winning elections. Right. So it was simply electoral uh, calculations that made him do what and he did. And it sustained that way for 
30, 40 10 years because it that. works, no? Yeah. So, I mean, what is happening in Bengal? The uh, minority of the majority plus the majority of the minority yeah. will put you arithmetically <laughs> ahead and you will keep winning election after election. There is no, arithmetically there is no other result. But by yeah. the way, that is another problem that will get solved in smaller states. Right. Uh, it will not be possible to play these electoral gimmicks too much anymore. Right. Because when you have a small state with just, what do I say, a 2 crore population, mm. uh, it is very difficult to play Chances these electoral tricks. Very difficult, right. almost impossible. Right. Uh, on 20th January 1947, uh, you write this 20th in the book. 20th January 1947. This is uh, Churchill's uh, speech. Ah, Churchill, yeah. Churchill ah. said in the House of Commons that any attempt by the Congress party to establish Hindu rule on the basis of majority will be fatal to any conception of the unity of India. And this unity was a superficial appearance imposed there by the long generations of the British rule and it would pass away once the impartial guidance <laughs> impartial guidance from the outside is withdrawn. <laughs> you have to admit the confidence with which uh, all this was uttered in, uh, by Churchill. But regardless, I have seen this quote floating around from time to time except for the fact that the word keyword Hindu rule is often omitted. Uh, so, to, is well, there any I have quoted directly from the government of India yeah. official transcripts of the debates. Right. So, I don't believe that what I have quoted is incorrect. because in popular culture. No, you're right. But what I'm mentioning is that in popular culture, in popular knowledge, that particular phrase is often omitted, and maybe uh, for well, people like to sometimes say. omit things that <laughs> they find inconvenient. What can I say? I mean, uh, how would you envision India at 100? Because largely your book deals with India at 75 and before that. Correction. I don't envisage India at 100. Mm -hmm. I envisage Bharat at 100. Wonderfully said. For anyone reading this book, Professor Desi Raju, what are the three things that you would like to take away with them? Dharma is a unique possession that only Bharat Varsha has. And in the modern competitive world, you have to play up to your strengths as a country, as a nation and now as a civilization. Right. The first thing I would say is that in this dharma, we have a unique and incredible weapon. Hmm? The second, I mentioned it earlier in the interview, we are an incredibly diverse country, nation, civilization. Unless, again, we enhance this diversity in constructive ways. Right. We are never going to realize our full potential. The main advantage we have over China is that they are ethnically, linguistically, everything like a monolith. Right. Yes. And as a scientist, I can tell you, monolithic structures are easier to disrupt right. with a few chance events than a diverse structure. It is very difficult to disrupt a diverse structure very easily. I think my model of 75 states and I give a nice, I think, pointillist description of diversity using this impressionist French painting technique mm. to show why 75, yeah. you know, Gandhi wanted 750 states in the 1946 right. constitution. I, I feel 750 is too many. It's a little too I much. think 28 <laughs> is too little yeah. And I have given a justification as to why I feel 75 is the optimal number. Right. So that you will read in chapter 4. So the second thing is that optimal use of diversity. Mm -hmm. I think the third thing I will take and this concerns a looking to the future. Once again, the difference between scientists and social scientists is I think we look to the future. Yes. We respect the past, but I think we go like to go beyond the past and present and always look to the future. Tomorrow, if India is going to become, I don't want it to become even among the top three countries. I want it to become country number one. Mm. I want Bharat to become country number one in the world by any token by 2047. Yeah. And if this is going to happen, we have now given enough and proper emphasis to equity. Mm. I think now we must make a radical change and go towards excellence. Right. Because the average person in India, his or her level has been lifted up to the point 
when the average person in India can dream of excellence. Excellence is no more a preserve of the entitled and the elitist few. Okay? Mm. So if one of the things we did right in 75 years was to bring up this average level. Yeah. But if we keep with this equity thing forever and ever and ever, as a simply as a vote gathering technique, mm. then I am afraid then we are doomed. Right. Because we have to make, and this is not an easy shift. It is like a shifting gears in a car. We have to shift from equity to excellence. Right. So to summarize in single words, dharma, second, diversity, and third, excellence. excellence. So these are the three things that I want readers of my book to take away with them. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this wonderful conversation. It's uh, very enlightening to talk to you. And uh, hopefully all our viewers will get a chance to read your book. We will be putting a description uh, link in the description below. And please do subscribe to both Bharat Vartha and Swarajya and press the bell icon. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And do let us know what you thought about this particular conversation with Professor Desi Raju. I'm your host, Sharan Sethi, signing off.